Hi, everybody. I'm so excited to be here. This is, I think, the first in-person in presentation I've done in probably two and a half years. Um, so it's great to be here. Thank you so much, Jesse, and to the rest of the organizing team, Harriet and others, um, to bring us together to, to talk about um, some really important issues today and the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, my name's Erin Rees, and I'm, as Jesse said, I'm a registered dietitian with the Health Unit. I've been there for almost 14 years. Um, and when I started, you know, if I, I, I could never have anticipated that my career path uh, would lead me to income policy analysis and evaluation. Um, but when we connect the dots and look at Canada's food guide um, and the cost of healthy eating uh, being out of reach for many Canadians, um, that's you know, when we follow the bouncy ball of kind of what needs to happen to help everybody uh, eat healthy, uh, many people need more money um, to buy healthy food. So the focus of my presentation today is going to be about food insecurity. Um, I was asked to speak to Sustainable Development Goals number one and number two and bring the local and Canadian context uh, to those. Um, first, I'm going to start with the land acknowledgement. Isn't this photo beautiful? This is uh, really close to my house at Kinsman Beach on Lake Nipissing. And I just want to acknowledge that at the campus here and in North Bay, uh, on North Bay uh, is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabeg people specifically from Nipissing First Nation, which is protected by the Robinson-Huron Treaty of 1850. I'm a white settler on this land, and I'm grateful to share space here with the Indigenous peoples who continue to reside here now and those who came before us. Today I'm going to be talking about public policy and income solutions to food insecurity, and we must acknowledge that much of the public policy in place in Canada perpetuates systemic racism and historical and ongoing colonization, as well as the resulting health inequities experienced by Indigenous peoples in Canada. We need to be working together to break down the systems that we have in place that were built this way. To, to, they were built to be oppressive and to be racist. We need to break them down and build back better with Indigenous leadership and support, and we all need to be supporting this. Oh, I'm not, there we go, okay. So we're gonna talk about food insecurity, the sustainable development goals, and what the solutions are to these problems, or the problem of food insecurity in particular. Um, I purposely didn't make this agenda linear because I'm gonna be jumping around a little bit uh, with these concepts and kind of trying to connect the dots in between. The other thing I just want to say is the last few lectures I've done on this topic have been two or more hours. So I've tried really hard to condense uh, into about 25 minutes. I know I probably have more content that I'm going to be able than I'm going to be able to cover, but I'm going to do my best. And uh, if you have any questions throughout, just hold them to the end, and I'm I'm really excited to have some discussion. Hopefully, there's some time. <clears throat> so the conference today is grounded in the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, I'm, like I said, I'm specifically asked to speak to number one, no poverty, and number two, zero hunger. Um, I, it's a bit intimidating to be critiquing some of the UN uh, materials and documents here, but the first thing I want to say is that we're really careful not to conflate hunger and food insecurity. They're different. Um, we were all feeling hungry, probably leading up to lunchtime. Hunger is the physiological response we have when we don't have enough food in our bellies. Um, food insecurity is very specifically not having enough money to buy food. You may or may not be hungry if you're food insecure. Um, I'll talk more about that in a minute. But um, they're obviously very important targets because the UN has positioned them first and second. Um, there's a lot of content under these two, uh, the targets and that sort of thing, um, that I'm not going to be covering today. Under Zero Hunger, there's a lot about sustainable food production, increasing production and re resilience, much of it which is very applicable to the global context in um, low-income countries. But I do want to, like I said, bring the national and uh, local context to these, uh, these two pieces with a focus on poverty reduction and food insecurity. So there's lots of different definitions for food security. Um, 
What I'm talking about today specifically is food insecurity. Inadequate or insecure access to food due to financial constraints. Financial constraints is the key piece there. It's very specifically linked to not having enough money to buy food. Food we have really great data, like pretty good data in Canada um, about food insecurity. It's measured annually very effectively through um, the Canada Community Health Survey. Um, and it's measured on a spectrum that ranges from marginal, where you're worrying about not having enough money for food. Um, in the past, we only reported on moderate and severe, and now we report on marginal as well, because what we know from the literature is that marginal, the mental health consequences associated with worrying about running out of money for food um, are very real. And they have, there is a health consequence with regards to being marginally food insecure. Moderately food insecure means you're relying on less healthy, uh, less nutritious, cheaper foods. Severely food insecure means that you are literally skipping meals and at times going without food. And again, bringing it back to income. It's because you don't have enough money to buy food. We know that food insecurity is very tightly tied to income, and as you can see here uh, on this graph, the lower your income, the higher risk of being food insecure you are. It's very clear. What's shocking, though, is the magnitude of the problem. Um, so I won't get into the details about why I'm reporting on 2017-2018 data. The, the, the surveys that we use to report on this data are collected in two-year cycles. We will soon have the 2019-2020 data, um, and it's the 2021-2022 data will be available next year. Um, but it's, it's not overly different year to year. It's pretty stable. Um, I'll talk a little bit about food insecurity during the period of COVID because there is some, uh, some speculation about that. But overall, it's our, our average here in, um, in our area is slightly higher than the provincial average at one in seven, one in seven households. So if you think of a city block and every seventh house being food insecure, um, the magnitude of the problem is, is very troubling. What might surprise you as well is that the majority of food insecure households have income from employment. Um, this speaks volumes to minimum wage rates being inadequate and uh, precarious work hours, people not being able to get enough hours. Um, so that's very problematic. I'm going to flip this data a little bit and show it to you in a different way. So although 65% of um, households experiencing food insecurity do have income from employment. When we look at all the households in Canada um, that are working, actually only 12% of them are food insecure. But look at social assistance, okay? 60% of households receiving social assistance in Canada are food insecure. And if you look at the color blocks, the dark block indicating severe food insecurity, it's like 25% of households receiving social assistance are so food insecure that they are at times going without food, um, which obviously indicates that social assistance rates are inadequate. Uh, here in Ontario, we haven't seen an increase since 2018, and they're not indexed to inflation, which is very problematic. <clears throat> food insecurity is also racialized. Um, we know black and indigenous households have higher rates of food insecurity, and this data um, has been manipulated in a number of ways to adjust for various factors like um, education um, and uh, household factors and that sort of thing. Um, and over and over, uh, the, the risk remains the same, and this is a direct result of systemic racism. Uh, and we're trying to call attention to this issue because we need to really be looking at the systems in place um, that are, are keeping so many of these households in poverty. I don't have a slide on it, but other households that are at high risk of being food insecure are people who rent rather than own their homes, as well as families with children. Uh, we know one in six households with children across Canada uh, are food insecure, and that increases to one in three households who have a lone parent. Um, so, you know, and it makes sense because there's only one income earner, um, but one, one in three households uh, 
with regards to single parent families being food insecure, so very troubling. Um, we don't have great data about uh, food insecurity and COVID-19. We have some population level surveys to show um, the evidence is pointing to that food insecurity rates increased uh, during the pandemic among households who were already at a higher risk, which is not surprising due to the widespread labor disruptions as a result of the shutdowns and that sort of thing across Canada. So food insecurity, um, you know, this is such a, a big public health issue because food insecurity leads to poor health. <clears throat> food insecurity can be both an outcome of poor health and poor health can be, uh, can cause food insecurity. So if you think of somebody who doesn't have enough income to buy nutritious foods, it can lead to a chronic health issue. Or if somebody develops a chronic health issue and then isn't able to work and their income is cut, then they're, you know, they become food insecure and then they don't have the foods, uh, the money to be able to buy foods for good health. So it's sort of a, a really unfortunate, vicious cycle. The correlations that we've seen uh, with regards to food insecurity and numerous, numerous chronic health conditions, um, it's, it's really, really upsetting. And um, so the orange bar shows food secure, people, the rates among people who are food secure, um, and the blue bars progressing up to the dark blue bar um, are the rates of food, uh, the, the rates among food insecure households. So, you know, Certain, certain conditions that we would expect. So for example, heart disease, hypertension, diabetes, but other stuff too that are, the correlation is less clear. So, you know, back problems, asthma, migraines, mood and anxiety disorder, there's more and more evidence emerging all the time about the mental health consequences of being food insecure and sort of, again, that, um, that cyclical relationship. Um, so that is, this is, you know, a main reason why we care about this issue so much in public health, I guess twofold, because we know the population level recommendations for Canada's food guide are out of reach for people uh, with low income, uh, living with low incomes, as well as the fact that food insecurity is so detrimental to health. Not surprising then, um, people experiencing food insecurity have much higher health care costs than those who are food secure. And so, you know, decision makers should really be paying attention to this issue, if for nothing else, from a cost perspective. Okay, so I want to chat with you for a minute about what we do around food insecurity locally. Um, part of my job at the health unit is monitoring food affordability using the nutritious food basket costing tool. So what we, Health Canada sets a national nutritious food basket, which is made up of foods consistent with Canada's food guide. And we visit 12 grocery stores, urban, uh, urban and rural grocery stores across Nipissing and Perry Sound, um, collecting the prices of these foods, which we then average, to come up with the average cost of healthy eating. So that information doesn't mean much out of context. So what we do is we prepare income scenarios where we look at the cost of healthy eating along with local rent rates and compare that to various income levels and household scenarios. Over and over, every year across Ontario, it shows that people living with, uh, relying on social assistance or working for minimum wage don't have enough money to eat healthy. Um, so it's very frustrating that it, it feels a bit redundant, but it's really important to have that local data and we utilize it uh, as, as effectively as we can. Um, we typically do a media release, a social media campaign, we keep an up-to-date website of food insecurity information, um, and we utilize it throughout the year uh, with various advocacy opportunities um, to, to bring that information to attention, the attention of decision makers. Um, and this is kind of a funny, being a broken record and a squeaky wheel, but I feel like that a lot of the time, um, because like I said, every year the information is the same. Every year I'm saying social assistance rates aren't high enough, minimum wage isn't high enough, people are living in poverty and they can't afford the foods they need for good health. And we know that we have to keep, keep championing that messaging and bringing that information forward um, and hopefully at some point we'll get the grease as the squeaky wheel, but it hasn't happened yet. Um, so let's meet uh, a friend here, Mark, um, from our NFB, our, our Nutritious Food Basket report. 
um, who is a 40-year-old single man on Ontario Works, just to help put the numbers into context. Mark currently does not have a job and he's receiving Ontario Works. His monthly income is $838 and his rent is $600 for a bachelor apartment in North Bay. Okay, good luck finding a bachelor apartment that cheap, but let's go with it. After paying his rent, he only has $238 left. The cost of healthy eating for Mark is $314. He does not have enough money to buy food or for his other living expenses after paying for rent. That's just one example. That's probably the most dire one, um, but the situation is very dire for single people receiving Ontario Works. Um, and I mean, let's walk a mile for a second, like put yourself in his shoes and how difficult it would be to be seeking employment um, and trying to, you know, get on your feet. And, you know, the language we hear from decision makers sometimes is, you know, the best way out of poverty is a job and pulling up your bootstraps and like this type of, um, that type of ideology. It's really, really difficult uh, when people are living in such extreme poverty. So I'm, <clears throat> okay. Um, we know that food charity isn't working. When I say food charity, I mean food, ba I mean food banks and soup kitchens, uh, some food programs as well. There's a, they look a lot of different ways. Um, there's no evidence to say that food charity reduces food insecurity. Um, it doesn't work for a lot of different reasons, uh, but the main one is that it's not getting to the root of the problem. It's not giving people more money to buy food. It's giving people a small bag of groceries in the case of a food bank, for example. Um, the other really significant problem with food charity is that most people who are food insecure don't go to food banks. Um, this is just one example, and again, the, the data is a little bit old, um, but we have years and years of this data um, that always looks the same. It's, it's only about 20% or so, give or take, um, of, of people that are experiencing food insecurity that will visit food banks, and the rest don't. Um, and I'm just showing this in a, a little bit of a different way with the local context. This was from a survey that we did um, about the, the indirect impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so on the far side, you can see, you know, only about 2% of people indicated they had used a food bank or a soup kitchen. But the tall bar here, um, you know, over 15% said they had difficulty paying for food. So we often think about food banks and food charity programs as a solution to food insecurity, but not only are they not effective at actually reducing food insecurity, most people don't use them. And I think it's just important to note that, you know, it's, there's no amount of resources that can go into food charity to make the programs like m better, more robust, uh, serving more people. I mean, you can do that, but it's still only serving a small minority of the people that uh, experience food insecurity, and again, just because people use a food bank doesn't mean they're food secure. I like to draw attention to this quote from Martin Luther King Jr., who, as we know, was ahead of his time in so many ways, but philanthropy is commendable, but it must not cause the philanthropist to overlook the circumstances of economic injustice which make philanthropy necessary. So I think a lot of people, you know, are really supportive of food banks because it makes them feel like they're doing something, they're helping, you know, most of us want to do good in our community, but it's important to reflect on um, the bigger picture. So I want to bring this back to the sustainability goals for a second. And I'm just going to go with my notes here. Um, <clears throat> One of the pieces I picked up on that I thought was really great and uh, the targets in the first goal is implement nationally appropriate social protection systems and measures for all. Um, and this, this is referring to uh, our social safety net and protecting people from extreme poverty, um, which I'm gonna talk a little bit about in a minute in terms of income solutions that are highly effective and proven to reduce food insecurity. Um, and again, I'm going to pick on the UN a little bit here because I was clicking around and I found on the Take Action website, or web, sort of web page uh, associated with the, the um, SDGs, and I found some really problematic uh, content here because they are kind of saying 
donate what you don't use for goal number one, for no poverty. Um, and I'm, I'm sorry, but again, it's sort of perpetuating that ideology that donating will help solve world hunger or world poverty uh, when it won't. It will not. Um, but it's, it's a piece of that will perpetuate the notion around, you know, and corporations do this, the media does that, they really pick up on like, oh, su su such and such organization donated X number of tons of food to the food bank as part of their recent fundraiser. And it's like, okay, rah, rah, you know, people are feeling good about that, but how does the end user feel going to the food bank um, to get that food, you know? Like, we, they're very much portrayed as feel-good stories and try to get people to donate more and more. And, and how helpful is it? I think this is problematic. Uh, as well, I didn't even touch on um, how problematic sort of the surplus food, food rescue movement is. Um, what I will say is that it just is, is further entrenching a secondary food system for poor people, which is completely unjust. Everybody in our society should have the money they need to go to a regular grocery store to buy food of their choice, just like the rest of us. But unfortunately here under goal two, um, they suggest wasting less food. Wasting less food will help reduce world hunger. Um, food waste is an important issue, really important issue. But by me wasting less food, I'm, I'm not helping solve world hunger by doing that. Um, but I, I did pick up on something that I'm gonna circle back to at the end, which I thought was really inspiring uh, from the targets and the actionable piece there. I've got like two minutes here. Um, I'm bringing us back to this key messaging around food insecurity being an income problem. And like I said, we have excellent evidence in Canada to show that when we increase social assistance rates, food insecurity drops. We have a concrete example of that from a few years ago in Newfoundland and Labrador, where they did increase their social assistance rates and food insecurity rates dropped by half. Um, we need higher minimum wage rates, and I know this is a bit of a, um, there's some contention around this with small businesses being able to keep up with increased costs and that sort of thing. <clears throat> but on a corporate level, you know, like we can't build corporations on the backs of low wage workers. We just can't. It's, it's unfair, it's unjust, and these people, like minimum wage workers are living in poverty. Um, Again, with a basic income, we had a basic income pilot project happening in Ontario a few years ago. Um, unfortunately, it was canceled under the current government and uh, along with the cancellation was the formal evaluation as well. So we have some data from that period to show that while people were receiving a basic income, they were able to use food banks less and purchase more nutritious foods, including vegetables and fruit, which, you know, big surprise, of course. You give people more money, they buy the food they need for good health. Um, but also, we have a basic income program in Canada already in the form of the, um, for seniors over 65, um, in the form of the Guaranteed Income supp Supplement uh, Old Age Security. And we see food insecurity rates, again, drop by half when low-income seniors turn 65. So it's concrete evidence that more income will reduce food insecurity. Affordable housing is a bit of a gray area because often, especially geared to income uh, housing, um, because it's not cut, cut and dry in terms of, um, like people living in, in geared to income housing often are still food insecure because they're living in such extreme poverty. Um, but of course we know more needs to be done around affordable housing because uh, everything's, the costs are just astronomical for people. Um, so, Food insecurity policy, income policy is highly political. Um, it's timely, this messaging, because we're in just in, in the front of an election here. So, you know, look at the party platforms and vote for the party that aligns with your values. There's some that are very supportive of, um, you know, our social safety net and others that are less supportive. So it's really important to be critical of that information. Um, just in terms of, and again, we're kind of late leading up to the election now, but a couple of organizations that are doing great work around this area um, and raising awareness uh, about this publicly, the Ontario Dietitians in Public Health, they're a good one to follow on Twitter. Sustain Ontario had a great campaign as well, uh, Vote on Food and Farming, um, so they're on Facebook and Twitter as well. And even our own health unit, we are putting out some really good messaging about the importance of getting out to vote and how, you know, policy issues really impact health. 
So what I want you to take away today is that food insecurity is a very serious public health problem in Canada. Food programs and food charity will never effectively address food insecurity. We have evidence of income-based policies that can reduce food insecurity, but political action is needed to address this issue on a population level. So again, I want to just share one quote from this great summary fact sheet um, from the Sustainable Development Goal number one, um, which I feel like they kind of redeemed themselves with me after I was clicking around more and I found the thing of the take action. I was like, oh, but okay. So, but in this, one of the pieces it says, which I think is great to close on, is your active engagement in policy making can make a difference in addressing poverty. It ensures that your rights are promoted and that your voice is heard, that intergenerational knowledge is shared, and that innovation and critical thinking are encouraged at all ages to support transformational change in people's lives and communities. So we need to be engaged in policy. We need to be following the evidence and bringing this information to the attention of decision makers. Um, in my case, I'm gonna keep making noise about food insecurity and about what needs to happen to reduce food insecurity. I feel really fortunate to be part of the North Bay Perry Sound District Health Unit. It's a progressive organization that really supports following the evidence and doing some progressive advocacy around this stuff. Um, and yeah, I'm just really excited to share this messaging with you today and I'd be happy to take any questions if there's a couple of minutes for that. Can I, can I take questions? Okay, yeah. Don't be, don't be shy if there's anybody. I also encourage you to reach out to me after as well. And I do, I didn't touch on my references throughout the presentation, but I've taken all my content um, from these three sources. Um, Proof is based out of the University of Toronto and they do amazing work around the data analysis and have really great knowledge translation, translation materials around food insecurity, as well as the Ontario Dietitians and Public Health website. Um, our food insecurity position statement is right on the homepage, um, as well as our, our local health unit page. Okay, thanks, first question. Um. Hello, Erin and everybody. It's easier. <laughs> um, first of all, I would like to kindly request your comprehension. English is not my first language, so maybe I have some trouble to talk. Um, I'm from Brazil, um, from the, well, we are able to eliminate famine in our country in eight years, uh, from 2002 until um, 2010 around. Um, However, we have a change in our politicians in Brazil, and since, in, since 2018, Brazil has come back for the famine map around the world. Um, so nowadays in Brazil, we have 28 million people in Hungary. It's extremely food insecurity, and the reason of that mainly it was because our Policy to reduce famine in Brazil, which was to open, uh, which was from two ways. One, uh, create popular restaurants where people could get any food that they want. Uh, if they can pay, okay. So they would pay around 30 cents for each meal that they had there, uh, followed by the additions, whatever. The second one, it was a household, um, financial household, sounds like that. Uh, so, uh, government provide houses for free, for people. So, in eight years, we were able to eliminate Brazil from the famine map. However, it looks like that our population thought it was a communist thing, so we have to change. So, we changed. In four years, we are coming back for the famine map. So, my question is, uh, it's interesting that Canada has that food bank uh, issue, which I think it's interesting. Uh, maybe not effective, but definitely in interesting because in Brazil we don't have nothing like that. So people don't have for where provide nothing. Uh, but my question is that somebody maybe in the past didn't um, offer that idea related to popular restaurants here where they can use some food by, by the government, for example, or for the, from the local farmers to provide food for free for those people. It's my question. 
Yeah, it's, those are th really insightful comments. Thank you. And it's so interesting to hear about the Brazil context for this. Um, yeah, most, I don't think most countries have food banks. Um, they were started in the 1980s uh, in light of a national recession. Um, and then, you know, in the 90s, by the, by the 90s, they were all across Canada in every community and, and have really become kind of entrenched in, uh, in our society. Um, and I would say, yeah, like, I mean, what you're talking about, the Brazilian context, that would be, you know, a major, major undertaking and would take great political will. Um, and, like, I don't know the ins and outs of how that would have worked in terms of, like, would the government subsidize restaurants to put out that food? Or, like, how would they be able to financially accommodate such a low, getting a low... Uh, Nowadays? Yeah. They closed. That's it. Okay. So, there are any more income coming from the government to support it. Okay. However, the taxes are still being, <laughs> well, requested from people. But yeah. So, yeah, to my knowledge, no. Like, nothing like that's been talked about. And I think because all of the evidence we have really points to, you know, a like in terms of promoting a just society where it's fair and equal for all, um, we want people to have enough money to be able to buy the food they need, right? So if there was some sort of sliding scale to be able to buy healthy food cheaper, like something like that, you know, I, I just don't see that um, rolling out broadly enough nationally um, for it to be uh, an effective solution. But I, yeah, it's thank you so much for for sharing that that perspective from Brazil. It's really interesting. Okay, another question here. Hi, yes, I just had a question about um, you provided a really nice, clear definition of food in insecurity. And so when I run into the term uh, food security, mm -hmm. you know, and I tend to run into that maybe when, um, from environmental programs, yep. like, could you yep. speak a little bit yeah. to that just so, yeah, because yeah, this is really great. That yeah, I would love to. Um, I guess, and, and so, and I feel like when I first started at the health unit in public health, there was a lot of buzz about the term community food security, where it's sort of having uh, a, a strong local food system. Um, and there's important benefits to, to having a strong, local, vibrant food system with you know supporting our local farms and that sort of thing. I think one of the things we learned from the pandemic was that although the Canadian food system is highly globalized, it functions shockingly well in a global pandemic. Like there were some supply issues, but very minimal. Um, you know, with, with toilet paper having, having been the biggest like stocking issue that we encountered, you know, the tomatoes were still coming from Mexico, the oranges were still coming from South Africa and Spain, you know, on and on. And so there were, were, were surprisingly few interruptions that way. Um, and again, it's, 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 I feel like in the past we really tried to conflate the two issues, but we struggled, like dietitians in public health across the province, we really struggled with trying to make sure that the food insecurity piece doesn't get lost when we bring it into the food security piece, when that brings in the environmental piece and like strong, vibrant, economic, thriving local food system they're just different, they're not the same thing. Um, and I think one of the things I've heard academics doing work in this area say is, you know, the connection there is just not clear in terms of like getting people more money for food and making sure they have the money they need to buy foods for good health, but also sort of the climate aspect related to food, uh, which, is, which is huge. Like food has a really, really big uh, climate footprint and we need to be talking more about that. And, but I was, I was asked to stay focused on the food insecurity piece today. But thanks for bringing up that question and it, it is a, a common question. I hope that's clear, my answer. Thanks, okay. One more here? Then we probably have to wrap up, eh, Jesse? Yes. Okay, thank you. Providing people with a secure income seems to be so difficult to achieve. Would, it, would the answer maybe be in providing low-income people with a loaded debit card or not food stamps, but 
you know, something other than actual cash in their hands? The evidence we have around, like, we have, we have evidence, especially from the states, from various programs, like the food stamps is, is it's not called that, any, SNAP, I think it's called now, um, but it's basically coupons for food, um, and other sort of like healthy food prescription type initiatives where, um, you know, a doctor might, like, a, like I've seen them where, uh, you know, they're funded to write a healthy food prescription where they're able to, like, um, get money to go and buy, spend on healthy food, but they just don't work. And I think the other piece I didn't really mention is that food insecurity, um, it's really a marker of extreme material deprivation. Um, so even like there's no amount of cooking or budgeting skills that can move someone out of food insecurity when you just don't have the money to buy the food. Um, and so that said, even if people are, you know, growing a garden or are extremely resourceful with their food budget and cooking and that sort of thing, they're still going to need money for other things. They're still going to need money to buy toothpaste or shoes or whatever it is. Um, and I think when we're looking at the poverty levels associated with the highest rates of food insecurity, especially severe food insecurity, um, the bottom line is I think they need more money. And I think like what we saw through the pandemic with um, the CERB is that money can flow when the political will is there and fast. So it's like we just need, I think, you know, there's hope that more will change right now. Uh, we often see uh, radical poli policy change as a result of uh, a crisis event, like post in the post-COVID era, it'll be really interesting to see what, uh, what happens and what the political flavor will be and how we vote and that sort of thing. So thanks for your comment. Okay, all good? Okay, thanks everybody.